Brain Scratch friends, it is me, John Lorden, and we're back with another weekly edition of Brain Scratch. And in this one, we're going to dive into what was ultimately a huge media story, but still has many unanswered questions and a couple of recent twists that are worth talking about. You probably recognize the image behind me. That is Madeline McCann. And unfortunately, um, this little girl went missing right before her fourth birthday. And it's, uh, there's some strange uh, areas about the disappearance, and there's a lot of finger pointing back and forth. As a matter of fact, this kind of drifts into almost John Benet Ramsey territory in terms of you know parents being looked at very harshly. Um, the media went nuts. This is a story uh, about a British family and um, you know in America we kind of uh, have an understanding that the British press is can be a bit ruthless um, especially com compared to American tabloid press. Um, all that being said let's dive in. Before I do I just want to give a quick shout out to Cyan Eyed 77 who brought this case to my attention. Quite honestly, at the, in the period of time that this was going on, I had decided that I wasn't going to watch mainstream media news coverage anymore because I was starting to feel like it was a game, and that game definitely came into play um, in this case. Uh, speaking of which, if you're interested in kind of understanding more of that perspective I'm talking about, there is a film that you can watch on Netflix in the U.S. Um, it, probably available worldwide also. It's called Night Stalker and it stars Jake Gyllenhaal and that will give you a bit of insight into some of the things that drive news stories and um, the pretty competitive nature that these companies have against each other and how they're really clawing and scratching for certain types of stories that they know will get them views. So uh, definitely check that, that film out. So Madeline McCann um, I started with the Wikipedia article here, and uh, before I read from it, I just want to say this Wikipedia article, it reads almost like a, um, like a novel. I mean, there are so many twists and turns that I didn't see coming, and the story just keeps unfolding and unfolding and unfolding, um, and I hope that it keeps going that way until we eventually learn the truth of what happened to this little girl. But in terms of it, a very interesting read, I highly recommend that you check out the Wikipedia article because there's a ton of information and it's pretty well written, um, particularly how it covers kind of the twists and turns that, that have gone on. So Madeline McCann disappeared on the evening of May 3rd, 2007 from her bed in a holiday apartment in Praia de Luz, a resort in the Algarve region of Portugal sparking what one newspaper called the most heavily reported missing person case in modern history. Um, for example, in um, Britain they were comparing this to coverage that was given for the Lady Di case, so that's how big this new story um, got, and still is, there's still a ton of interest around this. Madeline was on holiday from the UK with her parents, Kate and Jerry McCann, her younger twin siblings, and a group of family friends and their children. She and the twins had been left asleep at 8.30 in the ground floor apartment while the McCanns and friends dined in a restaurant 50 meters away. Now, when I first read that already, I got this weird twitch of, hold on a second, what? You left your three-year-old kid alone and went out to dinner? Um, it's important to know that they were staying on what is almost like a vacation resort, but not quite. There are private areas of it, but the apartments are accessible by public streets. So um, definitely there's some risk to that. I would highly recommend that people do not leave their children unattended. Apparently there was services at this place where you could have hired a babysitter to come and stay in the apartment. Um, there was another, I didn't look it up, it's called a creche, I think. If any of you know what that is, please tell me. But it sounds almost like a club where you could take your kids to and they could have fun for the night, maybe watching a movie or playing games or something, and then you go pick them up later. Um, so there was definitely other things that the kids could have been doing. That being said, these were young children. Apparently they had spent all day at the pool, and you know it, it doesn't sound impossible to me that the parents thought, hey, we can put them to sleep and go have uh, tapas at this place that's not too far away. And literally from the room that they were staying at, it was 
um, across a pool and then the tapas bar was right on the other side of the pool so 50 meters as the crow flies is what they say because that's a direct line between the two places um, walking it it's a bit longer than that because you have to go around the pool um, there was also a very strange condition in my mind in that they decided to leave the sliding door that was facing the, the tapas place they left that unlocked and um, their reasoning for that is because you couldn't unlock it from the outside. There was only a latch to lock it from the inside and um, that they could basically see that window from where they were sitting, which is somewhat debatable. Um, I saw in one video where they sent an investigator back to this place and he sat at the exact same table and um, even I saw another video, um, I saw two videos where they tried that and there is not a very good sight of that window from the tapas bar. Um, apparently, Jerry and Kate McCann were meeting up with their friends. Their friends became known as the Tapas Seven in the investigation, and all nine of them would dine at this place. This was a pattern that they had set up and done five times before this evening. So this was the sixth night that they have done this pattern of putting their kids to bed and then going out for a late dinner. Um, according to one investigation I saw, they stayed at that place from approximately 8.30 at night until almost midnight on most of those occasions. Um, so this was a good amount of time that they're spending away from the kids. That being said, apparently they had a regular pattern of going to check on the children approximately every 30 minutes uh, or having one of their friends drop in to check on their children, which might explain why they left one of the sliding doors unlocked. Um, but those are definitely some strange conditions around it. <clears throat> um, the parents checked on the children throughout the evening until Madeline's mother discovered she was missing at approximately 10 p.m. At first, the Portuguese police seemed to accept that it was an abduction, but after misinterpreting a British DNA analysis, came to believe that Madeline had died in the apartment, which placed a cloud of suspicion over her parents. Now, I'm not sure if Wikipedia has this exactly quite right about misinterpreting the British DNA analysis. I've seen a lot of commentary about the analysis and read parts of it, and it seems like the analysis in itself says that it's inconclusive. That being said, people keep trying to validate the conclusion of the analysis that some of Madeline's blood was found in the room, um, as well as uh, samples of it were found in a car that was rented almost three, actually more than three weeks after she disappeared. So um, that being said, I've seen a lot of argument back and forth about how the DNA is matching family members, it's not matching Madeline. Yes, it is matching Madeline, it's just um, some of the DNA has decayed. So it seems like in a bit of a point to argue. However, scientifically and legally, the document is very clear that they could not make a determination to make a match to Madeline on that. It matched characteristics of Madeline, but as I mentioned, her family also matches characteristics of Madeline. So very hard from conclusive. Um, something around that that actually supports the theory that possibly she was killed in the room is they brought two... Um, dogs in and one of them in particular is a cadaver dog that can detect if a body if a corpse was left somewhere and um, that dog did signal in two locations in the apartment one behind the couch and one over in I believe the parents bedroom in their closet that it seems like a cadaver was left in both of those areas the dog also detected something in the trunk of the rental car that the parents had rented so it's already we're at one of these points where there's a lot of information to start an argument in this. This is a highly polarizing topic. If you do a search on Twitter, you will see that there is a lot of people flaming each other. Although there's not a lot of people just supporting the family. I think the support for the family is kind of assumed at this point and people are choosing not to engage with the more vocal Twitter crowd who is definitely um, pointing towards the family as, as having something to do with this. Um, just real quick, I'm going to bring up my list so I can see it. I've left a ton of video links for you below, and I've kind of put them in chronological order, as well as um, 
kind of the official media story versus some of what people would consider the conspiracy story. Um, to start with, down there you will find the 48 Hours U.S. Uh, television show um, talking about it, and that was recorded about one year after. After that, you'll see a Crime Watch special, which is a UK show that's very good, and they conduct um, their own investigation of going and trying to recreate the events. And that was from October 2013. There's an update to that show that happens in March of 2014. Um, my friend Cyan, I had 77 that recommended this, has his own theory about what could have happened to the windows. Um, which that video is down there and then I start going into some of the counter arguments and more conspiracy theory stuff with uh, Dr. Ludke's interview on suspecting the parents a video by Heidi Ho 4 that I call both sides of the story which um, just goes over a lot of the conflicting evidence lie spotting analysis which is a pretty good video of a TED talk that I've actually watched before and then trying to compare um, the lie spotting tricks that she talks about in the TED talk to footage of the parents um, which definitely raises a couple of questions and then a very controversial documentary um, called Maddie the Truth of the Lie which is based on uh, Gonzalo Amaral's book and Gonzalo Amaral is he was basically the um, lead investigator or in charge of the investigation at the start of this whole process. And then at some point that changed. We'll talk more about that later. And then last in terms of video links is how the press mishandled reporting on Maddie. And that is pretty recent. That was just in November of 2014. Very good documentary about some of the fallout. Um, a lot of out-of-court settlements that have been made to Maddie's family. Um, for certain aspects of news reporting that probably shouldn't have happened and definitely something you want to take into consideration if you are looking at both sides the official story and the kind of conspiracy angle story because through that lens you start to realize why some of these theories are kicking around so strongly um, the news basically just really mishandled this they, they got almost addicted to reporting on this case and in instances where they started running out of official things to report on, they would start kind of coming up with theories and then just reporting on those theories. And as a result of that, hundreds of thousands of pounds have been paid to um, the family. Is it still pounds over there? UK friends, let me know. Did they go? Euro? I don't think so. It's still pounds, right? I don't know. Um, anyway, tons of money has been handed over to the family. The family has a, a few organizations now for missing children, but there is one in particular called Madeline's Fund, which has received most of this money and appears to be doing good work to try to help um, progress the case. So, a lot of video links for you to check out down there. <clears throat> um, the McCanns were declared Arguidos, which means suspects, in September 2007, but were cleared in July 2008 when Portugal's Attorney General closed the case. The parents continued the investigation using private detectives and some of that mo money that I was talking about. Actually, they also got donations, huge donations, from a lot of celebrities. Um, Simon Cowell donated to them. Um, they had video footage of David Beckham asking for Madeline's return. Both the parents are doctors, a bit prominent in their community. Um, the government, the UK government, got involved very early in this case, um, I think because of the international lines. Um, they met with the Pope. I mean, this thing is just, in terms of publicity and kind of exposure, it's, it's huge. Um, Scotland Yard reopened its own inquiry, Operation Grange, in 2011. And in 2013, they released EFIT images of men they wanted to trace. Basically, I keep seeing this, seeing this EFIT image. Um, it's just equivalent to like a police sketch. You know, someone describes what someone looks like, and here we would um, sketch them up on a pad or something like that. It seems like this is an electronic version of doing that. It's called an EFIT. Um, including one man seen carrying a child towards the beach that night. Shortly after this, Portuguese police reopened their inquiry, and both investigations are ongoing. So, if nothing else, you can see that there is a lot of resources um, being put towards solving this case. It's still in the public mindset, and there are still um, shows regularly reporting on this. Real quick, just so you kind of get a sense of feeling, um, this, these are the parents with 
a photo that has been um, aged up to what Madeline might look like now. And um, one of the things that the parents are kind of knocked for is that they're affluent and the mother is somewhat, you know, she's an attractive woman. Um, apparently she was tipped off by someone to not be very emotional in terms of pleading for her daughter's return because the person that took the child might kind of get off on that. So um, I don't know if that was a good decision or a bad decision. There is footage where you can see her crying over the loss of her daughter. Um, but her actions have been highly, highly scrutinized by a lot of people. Um, not her actions more so, but just kind of her, her demeanor and, and her ex expressions. Um, there is a part of the investigation that she chose not to participate in, but her husband did. So once again, you do have kind of these small flags constantly waving around the thought of um, there being some type of involvement or, or knowing what happened there. There is also a lot of practical evidence that works against that. I mean, these are people that were hanging out with seven other people having dinner that night. If you had you know, recently killed your child, would you really be going off to dinner and hanging out with your friends and drinking wine? And, and then having one of your friends go back to check the room. So there's some practical things that don't make a lot of sense. Um, one of the theories that's kicking around is, did they potentially use some type of medication to put their children to sleep uh, for, the, for the night, just to kind of knock them out so that they wouldn't wake up while they were gone? Um, Maddie had apparently complained that day about the night before asking her mom, where were you when me and one of my brothers were crying last night? Um, so that's, that's one of the theories. Maybe the, the children were drugged in, in some way so that these parents could go out and uh, have their evening out. Um, real quickly, I just wanted to bring up this image, um, and this is going to tie into a little bit later when we're talking about that lead investigator um, and what he did in terms of writing his book and his theories. But this is what is known as Tanner Man, basically one of the friends that went walking back and forth um, to the buildings to check on the children. At one point saw a man carrying a girl across the street, and that is where this image um, was created from. Now, based on the information I saw from Gonzalo, um, they kept this as a key piece of information in terms of the abduction theory. And this time frame when she saw this guy, I think it was like 9.15 at night or something like that, was kind of a hard point in the case. And it ultimately turns out that now that um, Scotland Yard has kind of reinvestigated this and put all this information back out, that another family that was vacationing there at the same time came back and said, we think that was us. We think that you're confusing uh, our husband and basically he went and took a picture of himself in the clothes that he would wear on vacation. And this, that's this picture over here. So um, it seems like the current detectives are pretty certain that this invalidates this whole testimony of Tanner Man and that 915 time frame does absolutely nothing for the abduction case, which has now helped them progress their case because they're looking at other possibilities that that 915 stopper kind of stopped them from considering. So, yeah, um, Madeline McCann's parents win libel damages in trial of police chief. So Gonzalo Amaral basically wrote a book, and it was released, I think, three days after Portugal closed its official investigation in 2008. And in this book, it's basically his angle on the case with all the testimony and evidence that he thinks supports the theory that the family killed Madeline. Um, I've pretty much covered most of it, at least that I, I haven't read the book, but there is a documentary that was made that was based off the book, and you can view that, that's in the video links below. Um, the one thing that kind of throws some of his evidence off key is that Tanner Man thing that I just told you about, because he really relied on that as part of the abduction theory. Now what I found curious about this, and I really haven't found a lot of information to kind of support this thought, was this statement in this article, and this is written on The Guardian, that Amaral, who was dropped from the Madeline investigation after several blunders, vowed earlier last year to countersue the McCanns. There is a um, 
it's not like it's a fundraiser of some kind. I don't think it's on GoFundMe, but um, right now, if you take a look at Twitter at some of some of that kind of fiery language I was discussing earlier, you'll see that it's kicking around a lot for people to try to raise funds for Gonzalo to try to appeal basically this conviction. This family um, won a considerable amount of money. I think it's about as much money as he made off of the actual book, according to some kind of light research that I did on this. Um, and in terms of blunders, I did see mention of just a few things like, you know, by the time the police had gotten there, there was probably 20 people that were in the apartment between all the friends and staff and other people that were looking for her. Um, I think there was something where they showed an investigator dusting for fingerprints, but they weren't wearing any gloves, with, which is apparently kind of a, a bad way to dust for fingerprints. Um, so I, I did see mention of a couple things where the police were kind of being pointed at as not handling certain aspects of, of the case properly. Um, the time frames for when they they had set up um, roadblocks and stuff like that were kind of later than would probably be helpful if someone truly abducted her and just took off uh, immediately. So I did bump into a couple things, but not enough, I think, for as strong as this is written. Here is an article from a couple weeks ago um, titled, Madeline McCann Trolls Pay for Emerald Court Appeal. As you can see, there is a bit of name calling already going around this, and um, it's kind of tough because I'm really trying to remain objective in terms of looking at both sides of this. And as I stated, there is some compelling evidence that stuff with the dogs is pretty tough, you know? I mean, if they're detecting that there was a cadaver in that room, there's a story behind that. Now, does that necessarily implicate the parents? I don't think it necessarily does. I think there might be a truth between these two theories that are kind of really knocking heads. Theory one being that this is a straight abduction. Theory two being that um, the parents killed this girl and got rid of this girl, which also, in my mind, there's some believability problems in. They went extremely public. Press was crawling all over this within a matter of a day <clears throat> of it occurring. And in particular, the press was very hot to speak to the family. That's where you're going to get all your great footage. So to think that the family would have been able to take the body, hide it somewhere, through this investigation where hundreds of people are looking for this little girl, go back to the body later, three weeks later, with a car that they rent to move the body somewhere else to possibly dispose of it, I just believe that they would have been under pretty tight scrutiny and that would be somewhat difficult to pull off with the, I mean, you literally have press from all around the world, you have investigators from two countries looking into this. Um, it's, it's, that's really just a tough thing in my mind to kind of get over. That being said, as I said, you can't refute the cadaver dog. There, for some reason, in that apartment, at some point, it seems like there was a, a body. So, perhaps, there is a story that is in between that. And that's kind of where we talk about a bit of the current theory. Madeline McCann police discover more holiday apartment break-ins that could be linked to disappearance. Basically, once Scotland Yard reopened this and started looking at this case and they kind of widened their search for information, they found that in two other areas of, on the southern tip of Portugal that there has been a rash of break-ins around the time of Madeline's abduction. And now they're finding that there was even more. When I saw original count on this, I think it was 14, and now they're up to 28 as of this article. So perhaps a theory that should be considered is someone was trying to break into this room. Madeline perhaps saw what they were doing. They became scared. Um, it's possible they killed her there and then thought maybe they should hide the body in the parents' room because the twins were still sleeping in their room and then maybe reconsidered it and said, no, we can't do that, took the body, went to the back window, opened it all up, threw the body out, and then got out the window, picked it up, moved off. Although, see, if you threw the body out, that's going to leave some evidence there, too. One of the hard things about the back window theory is to get out there while carrying a child, at some point you're going to have scraped the window, left some type of trace evidence, and they have found really nothing in terms of trace evidence around the window. Um, 
However, if nothing else from that theory I, I spoke about, perhaps there should be some theory about someone else that killed that little, little girl in that room. Now, how would that tie back to the parent's car three weeks later? There we hit a stopping point again, and that's just kind of how it's been going in this case for me. Just when I start getting a feeling of going one way with it, all of a sudden I bump into a bunch of evidence that kind of swings you back and says, oh wait, but it is possible. It, it could have been um, the parents. It's really, it's really a tough line on this case. So around the lawsuits, um, as of now, I believe that Gonzalo's book um, cannot be sold, but like I said, you can see the documentary on it um, in the links below. Um, other things that have been happening around this, Madeline's family has been going on. They keep doing events to essentially keep awareness raised to Madeline. And the latest one of those is that her mom did a charity bike ride. Um, I believe it was, yeah, Missing Madeline McCann's mom, Kate, will be leading a 500-mile bike ride from Edinburgh to London in June to raise 10,000 pounds for a missing charity. Um, so the story still continues. I, it's just, I'm honestly, I'm, I'm flabbergasted at it. I don't know um, what exactly to believe. Um, I do want to give you a heads up that if you go looking for this, if you look at hashtag McCann on Twitter, that's where you can find a lot of um, what some people would consider trolling, other people might be able to look through it and find some evidence. I did find a couple of the video links that you'll find below on kind of the counter conspiracy theories um, in that. Um, but there's just a lot of extremely charged information and also some very old information. I see a lot of people still trying to insist that the McCanns are suspects actively in the case. And according to several news sources I've bumped into and Wikipedia, that has been removed. They are not actively suspects in this case, um, at least from anything that I can find. But, you know, that's the thing about uh, people on Twitter, right? They just kind of say what they believe and they don't necessarily back it. So I think I'm going to turn it over to you guys here. Please, 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 if you have information on this case, comment it below. I ask that you do try to respect that there is, we don't know for certain what has happened here. Your belief about what happened is one thing, but if we can try to keep it to sharing information that would possibly help us better understand this as a whole, that is where we will be, be best served. It's very easy, with this case in particular, to get emotionally charged. And emotionally charged comments from my pretty in-depth experience of doing brain, scr brain scratch for a few months now, they don't help anybody. Uh, they really don't. You might feel good when you're leaving them. You're literally the only person that it's helping. If you have a strong belief, please, please, please give us the information. Give us the information. I'm not asking you to even be nice, but just give us some links, give us your insight, and let's share that information because it is important that we get to some grips of trying to understand this story at obviously a much bigger scale. The few small stories that we have about this case right now are very hard to validate. And I do believe, as I've already kind of done a little bit in this video, that there are other theories that we could consider and look at that might be a lot more feasible than these two small stories that keep fighting each other. So, thank you for your time. I always appreciate you guys joining me for another Brain Scratch. I hope um, this one doesn't throw your brains into too much of a twist. I'm going to have all the links for the websites also below, as well as all that video footage that you can uh, jump into. And I'm always available if you want to reach out to me at Lord and Arts on Twitter, or I really prefer, especially if you have information about the case, use the comments below. I always read the comments, and if you have something interesting, um, we might just do another episode about this case and keep it moving forward. I hope you're all having a great day, and I will catch you on the next Brain Scratch. <laughs>